Thanks so much, Val. Um, yeah, we're going to have a look at some of those passages today. And um, yeah, as Sam has shared, this is the start of a new series on, on missions. Um, but it's kind of a part of a bigger theme that we've been a part of this year, um, which is we've been talking a lot about legacy. Um, and if you're here early in the year, we had a series on, on legacy and, and telling some stories of the, the history of our church here. And and the reason we're doing that is because we'll be 50 years old as a, as a church next year. So it's sort of taking time to tell the story and and celebrate the history and then looking forward to the future as well. And so sort of we're doing the same thing with this series is, is people each week um, are going to tell some stories of, of God calling them to missions and um, to outreach over the history of, of our church because there's been a lot of people who've been sent all around the world, uh, different places, all been sent to the local area or have done things that have impacted people all over the world. It's, it's amazing to hear stories of just how much impact has come out of this group of people just faithfully following Jesus over almost five, five decades. So we want to tell those stories, but then also think about what, what the future looks like and how we can continue that legacy, but how it might even look different or God might call us to, to new things. And, and as Sam shared, we kind of focus on this, this call we're sensing to embrace more multicultural mission um, in our local, local region. So that's kind of what we're focusing on. But I thought what we would do today kind of to start with is because so when we're honoring legacy, part of that is telling stories, which is why we invited Jo to tell her, her story. But I, what I thought we'd do today is have a quick look at the biblical story, um, because we have a legacy that goes back way further to um, all the scripture and God's heart uh, for missions and God's heart for all, all nations and all people. And um, last week, we talked about scripture and, and how the Bible is a, a story and it's this story that tells the truth about who God is and who we are, and, and we find our place in this story. Um, so we're going to sort of take that and apply that to missions today, and I'm going to try and go pretty, pretty quick. Um, I think I'll skip over a few things. I got too big, too excited, and probably put too many verses in this this week, so I'll, I'll skip a few. Um, and, but we're going to do this big overview of the story of Scripture, and then we have to think of, well, where are we in that story now, and what does it look like for us to live that out? So let me pray, and then we'll dive in. So yeah, we thank you so much, God, for, for the legacy and history from this place. We just thank you again for, yeah, your calling on Jo and, and her um, faithfulness to that and how you've just led her each step and used her all around the world to impact so many people. And just thank you that there's many stories like that here in this place. And yeah, we pray for many more and just pray that you'd lead us um, today, God, to have your heart for, for all nations and yeah, all the world and, and to sense what you're doing even uh, among us here today. So we just pray you, you speak by your spirit and inspire us yeah, with your heart, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so um, like Val read, she read um, verses, right, from sort of the, the start of the Bible, sort of the middle of the Bible and the end of the Bible. And that's kind of what we're going to do very quickly today, just an overview of this whole story, because the Bible starts very big picture, right? In, in the start of Genesis, God creates the whole world humans sin and, and it leads to death and destruction and division and there's the flood and then humans try to, to unite uh, kind of in rebellion against God and God scatters and then there's all these nations and languages and it's all spread out all over, over the earth. And that's kind of this big picture start of the Bible. But then it's interesting because the Bible then gets very narrow. God just starts to work and tell the story of one group of people starting with one man. And then most of the Old Testament and this story is about one family, one nation. And it could be tempting to, for us to think that God only cares about that nation, not the whole world. What I want to see today is it's actually because God cares about the whole world that he picks this one nation to work through. And it's interesting because what we're talking about missions, right, and often missionaries are called to go, right? Joe was talking about packing up everything and having to leave and, and go. And, and God calls people to do that. And he called someone to do that. Right at this start, when he, when he picked this man named Abraham, he called him to, to go. And it's interesting because he wasn't young, right? He was old and he was married and he didn't have any kids and he was one of the least qualified people and God wanted him. He chose him and said to go. We see this in Genesis 12, one to three. The Lord had said to Abraham, or Abraham then, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. God picks unlikely people and calls them to go into foreign places, into uncertain circumstances, into uncomfortable places, and we have to trust him. And that's just what God does, right? He calls us to trust him. He calls us into the unknown. Sometimes that looks like going to the other side of the world. 
Sometimes that might look like going next door. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's whatever he's calling us to do, it's probably going to be uncomfortable. It's probably going to be uncertain. It's going to need faith. But God calls Abraham to go, and he gives him a promise. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God picks this one man and his wife who have no kids, who are old, and he promises to give them a whole nation of kids. And his promise is that through that family, they will bless all families. So God's heart, even in his choice of Abraham and his choice of the nation of Israel, is not to, to limit his blessing. It's actually his vehicle to spread his blessing. His heart has always been for all nations and all, all people. And there's so many ways you can see this in the Old Testament. Um, one is just his, God's care for foreigners who are even living among them, that he defends them, he says. God in Deuteronomy 10, it says that he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. He calls Abraham, obviously he goes to Canaan, but then they grow and end up in, in Egypt. And God wants them to remember what it's like to be in a different land. That's what you were, but God called them out. So people who are among them from different lands, they're here to have compassion, they're to love them. And ultimately, there's so many parts of the Old Testament where we see God's heart is that Israel would reach out, that Israel would be an example, that actually the whole world would know who their God is and would, would receive the same blessing that they have. It was never an exclusive thing. It was always meant to be this vehicle outward. I'll just skip over a few. So the Lord chose Israel, but his heart has always been for all nations to know and worship him. It's just that they were his instrument, they were his vehicle, his relationship with this one family would be a witness to all families on earth. And it's really good news for us, because I don't know if you, if you think about it, right, but, but before Jesus, right, the family of God was made up of people who were effectively of one ethnicity. They were Jewish, Israelites, and you could join, but you need to be circumcised. So it's like, it's pretty intense sort of initiation period, it's that ceremony. But there, there, was, a, there was ways for, for people to join, but it was, there was this limited, um, but it was meant to be a vehicle to bless other people. But, but we, if we were not Jewish or Israelites, we were on the outside. T to the family of God, we were foreigners. We were separate. And Paul talks about this in, in Ephesians, and because Ephesians are, are Gentiles. Whenever the Bible says Gentiles, it just means other nations that are not Jewish and not Israelites. He, he says this to them um, to remember that at the time you were separate from Christ and you were excluded from citizenship in Israel and you were foreigners to the covenant of promise without hope and without God in the world. So anyone who was not in Israel was in that category. And that we, we would have been in that category, right? If we're not Jews, we're outsiders, but in Jesus have been brought in. Um, we've read this verse before from Val. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So Jesus comes, right, as a descendant of Abraham, and Jesus makes a way for all nations to not have to become a part of this one ethnic family, but all nations, all ethnicities, all backgrounds can be united through faith in Jesus. His blood breaks down all the dividing walls. And we see it here. All these ways that people were divided now are united in Jesus. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. The, the divisions between the Jewish people and all the other nations are broken. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That what actually Jesus does is makes a way for all people to enter this family of Abraham. He opens the doors so that then actually if we have faith in Jesus, we are considered children of Abraham. We're under this blessing and promise that there's a blessing that actually then will reach out to all the nations, that we become a part of God's instrument to bless others as well. So Jesus has made a way for all nations to be united as one worshipping family. That was God's intention from the start, right? But in Jesus opens the door to all people. But then from there, we can have a sneak peek, right, at the very end of the story because we have that in the book of Revelation, right? We're in the story now still, right? It hasn't finished. 
But John saw how it's going to finish and what it's going to look like in heaven. And what he saw is this. After I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. He sees now right, people worshipping God from every nation on earth, from every language group, from every background, which means that they haven't all become the one culture. Right? They don't all look the same. There's a great diversity, but there's unity in worship around Jesus. Um, there's, there's one commentator who I was reading this week who was tracking this theme, right? God's heart for the whole world through the promise to Abraham opened up in Jesus that will be fully realized in heaven. And, and he makes this comment that I thought was interesting. If when God first called Abraham and designated him and his barren wife in their old age to be the fountainhead of his whole mission to rescue creation and humanity from the woes of Genesis 3 to 11, we imagined the sharp intake of breath among the astonished heavenly hosts, which is, which is interesting, right? He's saying like, when the angels figured out that God's picking Abraham, <laughs> Abraham is his choice, that he's gonna use that man, this old man and his wife as the starting point of his plan to rescue the whole world, all cultures, all backgrounds through this couple and their descendants. If the angels are like, ooh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> like it's almost what this commentator is imagining. Like the angels are like, ooh, I'm not sure. that seems like a bad idea. Right, but then in Revelation, it happens, right? They're all worshiping together and the angels respond in worship. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, amen, praise and glory, wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. And this is, this is obviously his imagination, but he writes, he writes this, and God in the midst of the resounding praises, will turn to Abraham and say, there you are, I kept my promise, mission accomplished. He starts with this one couple, and then it leads to this vast multitude, all backgrounds, all nations united in worship in Jesus. And obviously that is a very quick overview of the story of, of Scripture, but, but I wanted to highlight that from the start, God's heart has been for all people, from the start, God's heart has been to, to value his whole creation. He chose Israel as his treasured possession, but so that they could represent him to all people. And the ultimate end of the story will be a great diversity of different people, different languages, beautiful colors, but full unity in Jesus. Not uniformity, not division, but unity in diversity. Jesus has made a way for all nations to be united as one worshiping family. So that's a very quick overview of the story. So then it's interesting then just to think, like where do we find ourselves in that story, right? Because the story's still going. We, we obviously are post-Jesus, so we are included. We obviously know how the story ends because Scripture tells us, but it's still happening, right? It's still being outplayed. But we find ourselves at quite an interesting place because we're here 2,000 years after Jesus when the gospel was to go out to all the ends of the earth, right? In Acts 1, Jesus sends his people who are all Israelites at this point. They're all Jewish, but says they're gonna take this message and it's gonna go to the ends of the earth. It's gonna go to, to all people. And it's so interesting, like Matt mentioned this right at the start, that if you just, like the ends of the earth, right, is like an idiom. It's, it just means like everywhere. But if you just happen to take it literally, like it's very much basically where we are. There's actually a website where you can look up the furthest point from Jerusalem, and we're there. Like, it's, it's this part of the world. It's pretty interesting just to think about that, right? That's based on population of cities, like the literal furthest place is probably in the ocean somewhere, or is some of the smaller islands, um, sort of maybe around, around New Zealand. Um, but, but this sort of area of the world is geographically the furthest point from where the gospel went out. So it has gone to the ends of the earth, uh, which is very, very, very way, in many ways where we find ourselves. And in the last 2,000 years, the gospel has gone out to all different cultures and all different ethnicities all around the world. And wherever you go, it looks very different, right? 
You, it, you don't have to be English or European, right, to follow Jesus. That's one culture's expression of following Jesus. But there's an African expression of following Jesus. There's a Brazilian expression. There's a different language. Like, it, it's not conformed to one cultural expression. Um, the, the Bible Project on this had this really interesting quote that I saw this week. He, they said that the Jesus movement is unique as the most culturally and ethnically diverse people movement in the history of the human race. The story of Jesus speaks to every kind of human and can be re-expressed in innumerable cultural forms. No other religious movement matches the adaptability of the story of Jesus. And there's, there's obviously sad parts of um, the history of missions, right, where missionaries have gone and not taught people to love Jesus in their own culture, but have told people that they have to follow our culture, which is, but that's a failure. That's not part of the story. That's not God's heart. Actually, what, what the opportunity is that Jesus can be expressed in so many different cultural forms in different languages. It doesn't have to be cultural conformity, but actually God's heart is that there would be diversity. Uh, the Bible Project even said when you think about the biblical story and even the history of the Jesus movement, the fact that it's just so ethnically diverse, it, 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 the story of the Bible almost takes multiculturalism more seriously than kind of the cultural, our culture might. It's like multiculturalism is, is, is like a value in Western culture, but it's even more important in the biblical story and the vision of heaven. So that's an interesting place that we find ourselves, right? We're at the ends of the earth. Uh, we're a part of the, the most diverse movement in history. And it's in the other interesting place we find ourselves is in an increasingly multicultural country. Um, this is just an ABC article with some data from the 2021 census, just some of the key points. Um, whether in the 21, 2021 census shows uh, almost half of Australians have a parent born overseas. Um, that India has overtaken China and New Zealand to become the third largest country of birth behind Australia and England. And Mandarin continues to be the most common language other than English at home. That, that many people, and even many people here, right, were, were not born here, that, or have parents who were not born here, and, and more and more people are coming here. That we, we live in a, in a culture that's increasingly diverse and multicultural. And um, as Sam mentioned, we have a guest speaker who's coming next week to, to particularly highlight that and look at some of the information, the stats of what, what's our actual context in a, Australia and how it's changed and grown over the years. But it's quite interesting where we find ourselves in this story then, because we are a part of the most ethnically diverse movement, and we are in one of the most multicultural countries in the world. But our churches tend to be mostly monocultural. That, that doesn't tend to be reflected in the expression of how Christians gather and, and worship. That, it doesn't quite look like that revelation picture yet. Um, this is just a quote from the National Church Life Survey, um, which, which does stats on churches and was doing some um, stats around multiculturalism and gave some opinions, I suppose. I'll just read them out. Um, Most Australian churches can be described as monocultural Anglo. However, compared with other nations, Australia has a very high proportion of multicultural churches. In 2016, around 23% of churches were multicultural, where no one ethnic group accounts for 80% or more of the members. This is compared to 14% in the USA. Around half of all Catholic parishes are multicultural churches, compared with about a quarter of Pentecostal and other Protestant churches. The increase in the multicultural mix in Australian churches over time presents opportunities and challenges for congregations and their leaders. While Australian churches compare favorably in their multicultural mix with some overseas nations, there's always more that can be done to build community. Perhaps more can also be done within the church life to acknowledge the variety of heart languages people have for worshiping God. So obviously that's just some of their, their thoughts um, around that. And there's an encouragement there, right? That, that maybe compared to other places in the world, there's actually some more here, but still uh, there's opportunity for, for growth. There's opportunity um, here as the church. And, it's, and sort of why we're kind of focusing on this is, is this is kind of the, the place where we're feeling God's calling us as a church to grow in into the future. Um, We've been talking lots the last few years about being an intergenerational church. Um, it's a journey that we've been on of, of being together with a diversity of generations present and 
diversity of preferences and backgrounds because there are significant generational differences in our culture and in our church, but we've been highlighting the fact that we're one in Jesus. And that if we agree on Jesus, we have way more in common than we have difference. And actually, we need to love each other and, and learn from each other and grow together. And we're sort of on that journey. And then a couple of years ago, um, we went on a journey when, when Sam, um, we met Sam, and he came on the staff team um, at, with, with Rivers. And part of that journey was learning his heart for outreach, particularly um, to people, internationals in the area and, and people from different cultural backgrounds. And it really just felt like God adding to what we were already doing. We were on this journey of seeking to be diverse generationally. And it's like God's saying, no, that's not enough. You need to be diverse ethnically. You need to, be, you need to embrace all differences as an expression of the kingdom. So this kind of journey that we've been on um, because God has a heart for all nations and all people And the interesting thing is that to to do cross-cultural missions now, you don't have to sell everything and go overseas, right? It might just look like crossing the street. It might just look like chatting to someone at at the park, that actually people from all over the world are coming right here. And that doesn't mean that we don't need people to still go overseas, because we we do, and God will call people, but actually that we're all called just to be witnesses here to the people who are around us um, just in our everyday life. So we have a legacy as a movement of Christians across history of being a multi-ethnic movement, that the, the message of Jesus is for everyone. It's gone out. Um, and we have an opportunity in our current context because we live in a multicultural country and people are coming here from all over the world and we all have a call of Jesus in the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. So the, the opportunity is to, to think, well, what is God doing? What might he be saying to us? And how might he be calling us as a church? And again, sometimes if God calls us to things, they, they seem impossible, right? He called Abraham to have a child and to be a father of a nation. It's, in, it's impossible. Sometimes when God's calling us to reach out or to ex- explore a different aspect of what it means to follow him, it, it can seem really difficult. And hard, and sometimes the, this commission that he gives us to make disciples seems difficult. Or the idea of all differences being together and unity, and how does that work? It can be overwhelming. But we don't focus on that. In fact, the, the commission that Jesus gives is actually sandwiched between two points that are about him. He says this: "All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me." That Jesus is King and Lord. And there are powers that divide people and want people to be separate and want people to be against each other. And in Jesus, they've been defeated. Jesus has authority. He is Lord. And then he gives this commission and then he gives the promise of his presence. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So as we approach and think through missions, it's not about us. It's about the fact that Jesus is king. It's about the fact that Jesus is with us. And all we need to do is be willing and open to what he's saying and what he's doing. So that's just a quick overview um, to sort of set, set up the series uh, for this month. I said Tim's going to share, Tim Foster's going to share next week, and then Sam's going to share and get more practical around what does that look like and how do, how do we reach out and build and make connections. But we just thought, um, we just had an idea this morning that we thought would be a great thing to do um, just to start to move into this area. And that was just that we um, might finish uh, the, these messages each week with actually asking someone in our um, congregation whose first language is not English to come and come and pray, um, and because uh, I've actually just recently been sometimes listening to worship music in in another language, and I don't speak any other languages, but it's actually just still a, an amazing thing to experience, just to hear. Oh, people praise Jesus in other languages, and and in heaven, there's there's going to be all different languages, and it, it's going to be a beautiful diversity, and and we don't want things to all be one. We want diversity, but unified. In Jesus, um, so so we're going to have try and have someone d- different come and pray um, each week. So we're going we're to pray to finish in a moment, and then and then sing. And um, as always, if you'd like someone to pray for you today um, around this missions theme, or it could be around anything, um, Greg and Janelle are just going to be over here after the service, and th- they're, they're happy to pray for you if you'd like like prayer. But um, Susan's going to come and pray this morning. Um, thanks so much, Susan. And may, so let's, let's stand together. Um, And then, yeah, we we will um, pray and then we will respond in in worship. Thanks. Let's pray. 
but I'll pray in a different language. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you after that. <laughs> Apa pedawe, umur ini nama kagak setuhrum, umai tu dikirain, umai magi umai padat dikirain. Indah kala velele, ni ni thame, namlode irinde, umur ye presenam namlode irpa daga, umur ye wadil, nadekhe engkau ke udewi sayberaga, umur ye padil, nadekhe engkau ke udewi sayberaga. Ni nallaver, ni walaver, umur ye kirbe engkau ke podo manade. Katawe, niatnya kami engkau deh irinde, indah wara murudum engkau deh irpeiraga. Umur deh presenam engkau deh irpadaaga. Umur deh nama tu kagas tuotrum. Umur Yesuin nama tu jebi kirain pidawe. Amen. I prayed this in Tamil, and I just said, I prayed, Father God, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for your grace that is sufficient for each one of us, that you will lead us in your ways and that you'll help us to walk in your way and in, and your word will be, and in your word, uh, and, uh, sorry, according to your word. And I just finished. Uh, I just um, worshipped him and uh, thanked him for his presence and for his grace and just prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>